Good day. It's Wednesday, October the 20th. I'm Martin Gagel with Market Radius Research. Today, we've got CEO Sean Krakowski and CFO Luke Caplet of Nanalysis joining us. Uh, Nanalysis is a global developer and manufacturer of compact magnetic resonance imaging and spectroscopy technology products, software, and services. I've got an analysis on the call today for a few reasons. I think the technology is fascinating, and it's seldom yet to see a small microcap Canadian company with so many real science and developing so much cutting edge technology. I also see the industry and the company's opportunities parallel in many ways to the dynamics of the PC and semiconductor industry from 30, 40 years ago. So I see a lot of growth opportunities there. I've known the company and been a shareholder for several years, and it's great to see the company execute their vision and their business plan. Remember, this is neither a recommendation nor investment advice. We're here to learn about the company. Sean and Luke, thanks for joining us today. And take it away. Let's hear about the story. Thanks very much, Martin. It's a pleasure to be here with you and your subscribers. And, and yeah, as you mentioned, uh, we make portable NMR and MRI machines for industrial and healthcare applications. Uh, we do seek safe harbor for forward-looking statements. I'm the founder of, of, of the, the company. I started the business 11 years ago. Uh, by education, I have a master's degree in electrical engineering, but really I'm a tech startup guy. This is my third tech startup. Uh, we have a fabulous CFO who's on the call today, Luke Caplet, with just tremendous M&A and corporate finance experience. Uh, and then Julia Muller, our, our CTO, has a real unique vision for the future of, of magnetic resonance. Uh, where we're trading at today, uh, we have a market cap just under $100 million. Uh, We have $77 million outstanding shares. If you look at our last financials that have been uh, announced, we're, we're at a revenue run rate of about $17 million per year. Um, we're all cashed up, so uh, about 14 million in the bank right now. And you know we've got demonstrated profitability in the form of po positive EBITDA and a little bit of positive net income as well. Um, so you know we're not one of these tech companies that's uh, bur burning boatloads of cash at this stage in our business. A lot of levers we can draw on to, to optimize what we're doing over the next couple of years. So our vision is to one day disrupt the MRI space. You know, we feel like it's broken. It doesn't work the way it should work. The way it should work is any one of us should be able to make an appointment at our local pharmacy, go down and sit in a nice chair, have an MRI of our prostate or our pelvis area, uh, should be connected to the cloud driven by AI and then accessed by a trusted service like WebMD. And then we should get a, a pleasant message saying, you know, no problem with your prostate or nothing unusual with your ovaries, you know, no need to consult your doctor. Uh, or similarly, if you're playing football on a Friday night in East Texas and you get your bell rung and um, you, know, you should be able to go into the locker room and have an MRI of your head and determine conclusively if you've had a concussion or not. You know, so that's our grand vision. That's where we're going. Um, in terms of where we're at today, we have proven products in the marketplace. Uh, we've demonstrated explosive revenue growth and we have an impressive suite of intellectual property. Just to sort of get um, calibrated with our, our subscribers and everyone on this call here and about magnetic resonance and establish a common frame of reference so that we can kind of discuss this accurately and, and efficiently. There's part of this story that everybody will get. Um, and then there's a twist. And it's the twist that makes us unique in the world, both as a stock and as a, as a company. So the part that everybody will sort of get and connect with is, you know, I've depicted in the, in the bottom left here, the picture with the, the blue tint, a typical MRI machine in a hospital. Um, it's very large and expensive. It uses superconducting magnets, uh, requires liquid helium fills to keep the superconducting magnets cool. It's complicated to use. It's behind a gatekeeper and so on and so forth. And, you know, you made an analogy to computing and, and we think that these MRI machines that are the incumbent machines are analogous to the old mainframe computers where the, you know, the end users could, couldn't really use them themselves. So that's the part of this story that sort of everybody will get. But the twist is most people don't realize that these machines are also used in industrial analysis. So they're configured slightly differently, but the technology and the basic mass and math and physics are exactly the same. And, and I've depicted one of those configurations to the left with the person in the lab coat. It's the same superconducting magnets requiring the same liquid helium fills to keep them cool. It's the same electronics, the same low-level software. 
But rather than creating in, in, an image, they tell you exactly uh, what molecules and how many molecules are in a substance of interest. Um, but from a technology platform, they're exactly the same. So what we've done is we've miniaturized this technology and made it cryogen free. So no liquid helium fills. So um, that would, that's what makes us unique in the world. And, and in fact, um, on this next slide, I'll show you what our current product portfolio is. Um, the products on the top left are the products that are sold into the industrial analysis side of this opportunity. They're the full miniaturized system, including the miniaturized magnet, the electronics uh, and the software. Now the product on the top left is in fact a medical imaging product. Um, it's not the full system, um, but it includes the uh, electronics and low level software, the same electronics and low level software that are in all of our products depicted here. Um, but it's sold on an OEM basis and, and it's sold to like tier two preclinical imaging companies like Mediso. It's sold to into organizations in China that are developing next generation uh, MRI systems. So, you know, we've built a common technology platform that leverages the commonalities between magnetic resonance for industrial analysis and magnetic resonance for medical imaging. And as I've said, uh, the basic math and physics of both of those opportunities are the same. Um, so, um, John, what's Go ahead, Mark. Go ahead, Mark. Are, are you referring to the MRI console? On yes, so on the top right of this slide. Okay. The MRI console is indeed the, the medical imaging product per se. It's sold as a product. Um, and, you know, it, we, we've generated in trailing 12 months approximately $2 million in revenue um, on the medical imaging side of our business. So, so um, you know, it's a real and growing part of our side of our business. The majority of our business today is associated with the industrial analysis and namely the products on the top left here, the 60 megahertz and the 100 megahertz products as I've depicted on this slide. So the MRI console, you would, that is the brains of it. So you would take an MRI machine, plug it into it, and then it would control it and, and extract the data out of it. So it's a new control unit. Um, that's, ex that's exactly right. And it provides um, people that operate those machines in certain in, uh, research environments and so on with more flexibility um, to generate different types of data and, and so on. And it's really associated with the de you know, initiatives to develop next generation MRI machines. I, I, I always like making analogies and I always step too far with them. But let's say if, if it's the TV, you're going from like a cable box to like a smart TV, like an Apple TV. So you can do more stuff. You can take the data and, and do more things with the same dumb TV. That, that's exactly right. You know, that's a great analogy. And, and I'll, I'll build on that a little bit. So, um, you know, people wouldn't, would, you know, civilians wouldn't really know this, but the MRI machines that are currently in hospitals only look at one type of atom in the human body, the hydrogen atom. Um, and it's basically a glorified way of looking at water flow in the human body. And then, you know, some smarts to, to you know, interpret the water flow, right, for abnormal tissue. Um, but there's other important atoms in the body that also should be looked at when doing medical imaging, like carbon atoms. And so um, our technology has the capability to look at other types of atoms and to do a more particular um, analysis, um, not just create an image that is interpreted, but actually to determine um, which cells are cancerous and which ones are not. Um, and so that's associated with the visionary part of our business and, and really uh, bringing the state of the art of, 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 of the science and the technology into the medical imaging space today because it, it, the MRI machines that are in hospitals today do not uh, reflect the state of the art of the technology. Okay, and then, sorry, I, I guess we're getting ahead of myself, but in that, my whole PC analogy, like as computers developed, it was kind of a box. Now you've got the video card, you've got the software, you've got different components and you can kind of mix and match. And you're providing these big MRI machines where you just bought one big box. You're providing them some componentry to create better or different information or, or uses out of it. That's exactly right. Right, so yeah, so really the main point of this slide is to convey to our viewers um, what our product portfolio is and what our current business model is. So our current business model is capital equipment sales at high gross margin. So we're at 65% right now. And uh, we think we can push those uh, in the direction of 75%. Um, and, and so, you know, um, we'll always be a, you know, a product company per se, uh, but we are superimposing other types of revenue streams on top of this um, sort of capital equipment sales. 
um, namely software. So uh, we just closed an acquisition of a company called One Moon Scientific um, that has a software package for magnetic resonance applications called NMRFX. Um, and so we just, for the first time in our company, we've started to price out software differently. Um, and then we're, the way we're evolving that is you're going to do the basic data analysis on the machine. And then if you want to do more advanced uh, processing, you go off onto the cloud. And so as that happens, we'll be able to um, introduce a software as a service revenue stream as well. Uh, in addition to that, we'll also have a consumables part of our business going forward, like a cartridge aspect or uh, a cartridge that is consumed and then uh, more purchased from us, from, from our customers. So that'll be another future revenue stream uh, in addition to the capital equipment sales. John, and maybe we'll, I, we'll get this um, uh, for the one we talked about financial. You talked about increasing gross margins. Are you seeing that coming from that you have pricing power or let's say you're your 100 megahertz units relatively new, are you still kind of working down the cost curve so that the, the first 50 units you build are going to be higher cost, but then the next 50 units you'll have created efficiencies and it'll be lower to manufacture? Yeah, it's both of those things. So we are seeing that we have pricing power. There's tremendous uptake for a 100 megahertz product. Um, so, you know, we're not seeing any softness in, in pricing at all. We're seeing strength on the pricing side. And then you're totally right. Um, we have not exhausted, you know, cost reduction opportunities at all. Um, and as we continue to scale up our business, those economies of scale will uh, allow us to reduce our, our costs. You made a particular point about that in that our 100 megahertz is a new product. And yeah, our, 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 our costs tend to be higher on a new product. And then after several quarters on a particular product, um, they, um, they go down dramatically. So that's exactly right. All right. So I'll just talk a little bit about where we came from. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, I started the company from scratch 11 years ago. I uh, hired some pretty smart people from Caltech and MIT, uh, moved them up to our facility in Calgary, and uh, they're still with the company, shareholders driving us towards our vision. Uh, we developed the, the IP strategy uh, and the tech platform in-house ourselves. Uh, we built the products ourselves, the manufacturing, and then as we evolved, we started to build out our direct sales organization, our distributor sales, um, marketing, HR, corporate finance, you know, the whole ball of wax. So we've, the vision is and has always been to build out a full blown operating company. Um, about two and a half years ago, we had a chance to exit. It was a large American company that had failed to develop a competing product and then tried to buy us. And it was a real sort of galvanizing and unifying moment for our company because our, our key shareholders, uh, and you know, we're backed by the largest angel investor group in this region called Q Group, they didn't want to sell. And they came to me and said, Sean, you know, we're having too much fun. We want to put more money in the business, not take money out. So build a world-class company right here in Calgary. I said, absolutely fabulous. I'm excited to do that. And I said, you know, what I really want to do is I want to go public um, because I want, to, uh, I want to buy some companies and I want to have a Pubco vehicle to do that. Um, so in, in June of 2019, we went public on the Venture Exchange. Um, we did a concurrent financing of $6.5 million at 60 cents per share, which was the, the price that our exit opportunity was at. Um, and then since we've been public, we've done what we said we were going to do. We, we, we've closed two acquisitions um, and we've uh, launched a new product, uh, which again has had tremendous reception in the marketplace. So it's just been a fabulous first decade but we think our next decade is going to be even better for our company. And, and, you know, we have some exciting things in terms of short-term catalysts coming down the pike. Um, we're starting to see independent research analysts initiate coverage of our company. Um, recently, there was one put out by Echelon, which was an excellent report. And I invite everybody to, to look at that if they want to read 35 pages of detail on, on where our business is going. And we, we expect other analysts to, to, to um, initiate coverage soon as well. You'll see us close our next acquisition fairly soon. You'll see partnering announcements. You'll see continued demonstration of explosive revenue growth. Um, so really some exciting things, both in the short term, the medium term, and then you know, with our grand vision down the road, we think um, the future is very bright for, for an analysis. When you founded the company, was that like, like um, you, you've got an engineering, electrical engineering background, but was it sort of some core IP out of like University of Calgary that you, you're licensing? And, and, and I'm guessing, are, do you have any sort of 
long-term licensing deal, someone who owns kind of the core technology that you, you still write checks to every month or? No, we developed all the IP from scratch. Um, there was a, a, you know, a connection. I, can, I don't mind telling the story of, of how the company got started, if, if you'd like. Sure. If it doesn't go too long, yeah, let's hear it. <laughs> okay. Well, that. try to keep it short. Um, so a friend of mine, who's also a professor of electri- electrical engineering at the University of, of Calgary, uh, Michael Okinevsky, Dr. Michael Okinevsky, called me up one day and I hadn't seen him for a while. And he said, hey, I want to meet you tomorrow at the university hospital. There's something I want to show you. Uh, so I said, sure, sure, Michael, I haven't seen you in a while. Let's catch up. So I go there and he introduced me to a bunch of scientists and shows me this gigantic machine. Um, I said, hey, Michael, what's this? Well, it's called a nuclear magnetic resonance analyzer. And oh, fabulous. And these are great people. But, you know, why, why am I here? What? And he says, well, I want to build a business around miniaturizing this. So I kind of got intrigued. And he told me about how these things are widely used in industry and exactly what they do. They can determine what molecules and how many of them are in any substance of interest. And so got further intrigued. He started to share some ideas about intellectual property, you know, pretty smart guy. Um, and uh, so basically he had me, had me hooked and we went for lunch. And then at the end of the lunch meeting, um, he said, there's one more thing, maybe the most exciting thing about this opportunity. And he showed me a picture of an MRI machine. And of course I knew what an MRI machine uh, was. And I said, well, you know, that's great. And he says, it says, Sean, if we can miniaturize the configurations that are used for industrial analysis and build up a solid a revenue stream and business foundation there, we can also miniaturize and democratize these MRI machines because the technology is the same, the math and physics is the same. So that sort of sent me over the moon and got me really excited about the opportunity. That was in October 2008. Um, and basically, instead of going home, I, I drove directly to my lawyer's office and we incorporated the company right then. Wow. And he seemed to have a clear sort of vision and pathway even like 13 uh, years ago. That's kind of cool. For sure. I mean, this is a senior uh, guy that's been thinking about science and technology his, his whole life, right? Uh, he's actually on our board of directors uh, right now as well. So, um, you know, world-renowned scientist in magnetic resonance. Um, you know, so there's an example, again, of, of our core team, um, whether it's on the board or whether it's a, an engineer or a scientist, um, you know, from 11 years ago is still all with the company. And then we've just layered on really talented pieces as we've gone from, from phase to phase in our business. Most recently, of course, our fabulous CFO, Luke Caplet. All right, thanks. Let's move on. Yeah, so just uh, our, our technology is patent protected with an exciting patent pipeline. You know, we file in the United States and the EU and, the, and, the, and, and, and we also file in places like India and China. So intellectual property is an important part of our business. Um, in addition to the patents, we, we have an impressive suite of, of trade secrets, which we add to every single day with our roughly 50 R&D scientists and engineers. And then a key part of the story is also proprietary manufacturing. You know, when I, when I started this business, I didn't want to do all this awesome innovation. And then as soon as we're successful, have it ripped off in China or India. So before we even had a product, we, we invested in proprietary manufacturing. And the, and the fruit of that is if you got a hold of one of our products in China today and you took it apart and you had 10 PhDs working for you that were smart enough to understand our patents, you still wouldn't be able to reverse engineer our technology unless you knew exactly what we're doing in our proprietary manufacturing facility right here in Calgary, Canada. So our, our growth strategy is sorry, to, Sean. Go ahead, and, and I'm sorry. thinking um, the 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 hardware. It's not just the hardware how it's configured, but also then you've got the software to how to interpret it, and and so you get this types of data. There's error correcting and figuring out like a bus goes by and creates an extra magnetic field and how to sort of filter that out and and all that. So it's a real like tight knit integration between the hardware and the software to make it work. You can't sort of layer one software onto someone else's magnets and get it working or anything. That's absolutely correct. So it's, it's, it's hardware, it's firmware and it's software and, and they definitely work in an integrated fashion as you, as you suggested there. And even just within the hardware world, um, you know, um, one of the reasons why these big companies have tried to build these uh, systems and failed is because the overall system um, is not totally digital. There's a big digital part of it for sure, uh, but it's still largely an analog system. And, and I, I'll, when I talk analog, I like to say a real system. 
and, and, and real systems that have to work precisely, um, not just in a sort of digital way, but in a real physical way are extremely difficult to both design and to manufacture properly. So even just the hardware part of it would be impossible to reverse engineer unless you knew exactly what processes were involved in manufacturing them in our facility in Calgary. I guess that's why they call it hardware. <laughs> there you go. Um, so in terms of our growth strategy, you know, we'll always be an innovation company with new products at different price points. Um, uh, you know, in, in absolute terms, our R&D budgets will always go up year over year. Um, on a percentage basis, they will go down and settle towards the kind of classic, you know, 12% of our overall budget, um, but they'll go up in absolute terms. And then we'll blend that sort of organic innovation with uh, industry partnerships where we OEM um, uh, our products to big companies that want to take them deep into verticals. Um, you know, we publicly announced some, some of those part partnerships. And in some cases, they add a little bit of value-added software on top of it. Um, and then, of course, rebrand it with their, with, you know, their, their market reach and, and everything like that. And we maintain ingredient branding. Uh, and then, of course, we've talked about acquisitions. And there's still about 10 more companies that I want to buy. And we've got flexibility on exactly what path we can traverse as we make those acquisitions. You know, for example, depending on how the negotiations go. Um, and they're all complementary companies, right? So this isn't a roll up uh, of similar companies and just exploiting cost synergies. We certainly do um, exploit cost synergies, but they're complementary companies. And so our first one was um, uh, magnetic resonance electronics. Our second one was high level magnetic resonance application software. We're looking at companies that um, have uh, vertical specific um, 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 products, but have lost the ability to do R&D and manufacturing because they've had some financial problems. So we'll sort of uh, refresh them and bring them to life. And then we're looking at companies that are pure sales and service uh, companies that, you know, operate profitably by definition, and it's in their DNA to just do sales and service. Um, so, so you'll see a di totally different mix of companies that we buy. Um, now, there are some common themes to these acquisitions. One of them is they tend to be run by kind of scientist founder type guys uh, who have done some cool things. But they don't know how to raise money. They don't know how to scale a business. They kind of been banging their heads against the wall for 15, 20 years in some cases. Uh, and they're ready to sort of join our consortium because our upside is still intact. You know, we don't try to grind them down and kind of kill their dream. We try to make their dream come alive. And all we do really is put risk underneath their, their story and, and, and free them up to do what they've always wanted to do. So, but they're a little bit broken and therefore we can buy them for like one times trailing 12 months sales kind of thing. Um, and then we spend about six months fixing them up a little bit, increase the revenue run rate, and then it becomes even more accretive to existing shareholders. And if you look at where we trade, somewhere between five and seven times sales, so it gives you an idea of, of how accretive these kinds of acquisitions can be once we integrate them and then, and then grow them. And they're fully complementary to our business. So it's not just buying revenue for the sake of buying revenue. It's complementary magnetic resonance sensor companies. Um, and then another part of our growth strategy, which is very important, is how we communicate with the financial community. Um, so over time, what you'll see there is you'll see us use more the, the language of medical imaging side of this opportunity, because that's the side that the financial community understands the most. So right now, we're focused in on the unregulated industrial analysis side of this opportunity. Um, and then we have a very specific strategy to catapult us right into the middle of a full-blown FDA-approved human medical imaging uh, MRI product with partners. So that sort of encapsulates uh, our, our growth strategy. And um, one, one further thing sort of worth highlighting is that, you know, yes, we're about miniaturization, right? You know, lower cost, portability, that sort of thing. But, but it's even more broad than that in that it's about democratization or as I like to call the appification of magne magnetic resonance. So, you know, if you have a PhD in, in chemistry or if you're a radiologist, you can interpret the data on the left of this slide and then take actions on it. But our customers are telling us that in the future, it's not gonna be their experts that are using our machines. It's gonna be, for example, a, a mining technician who is trying to analyze a lithium brine pool and just wants one number, you know, percent lithium in this brine pool or, or um, an, a prison official who's confiscated a suspicious white powder and just wants to know, you know, is there methamphetamines or, 
or is there an opioid in, in this suspicious white powder, you know, red light, green light uh, kind of a thing. So th this is a huge initiative for our company. In a lot of cases, we develop these apps ourselves. And then in other cases, we work with third party partners. Uh, the, this is a, our, our view of our market opportunity. So in a general sense, we're in the scientific instrumentation space. Uh, some people will prefer to use the term test the measurement. Um, it's, it's roughly the same thing. You know, over $75 billion per year is spent on test and measurement equipment, and it's growing by 5 to 7% annually compounded. Um, you know, everything in the modern world is tested and measured. You, you can't um, develop new products. You can't deal with health and safety. You can't deal with quality control. And you certain, certainly can't manufacture economically efficiency, efficiently without test and measurement equipment. So we really love the general space that we're in. The addressable part of it for our company today is about $3 billion. Um, and we think that with ongoing miniaturization and, as I mentioned, democratization, we can grow the addressable part of this opportunity for us. Um, you know, many people at this point in the presentation say to me, Sean, well, who do you sell to today? So, okay, so, so today we're selling to the, you know, like the biggest companies in the world, like Pfizer and, and Eli Lilly and DuPont and BASF and, and Corning. And then we also sell to like tiny little two person biotech startups. We sell to the, to the most famous universities in the world, like Harvard and MIT and Oxford. But we'll also sell to like a little community college in rural Mississippi or a rural India. Um, and by the way, in those kind of places, there are no liquid helium trucks driving around to keep the superconducting magnets cool. So the cryogen free aspect of our technology is a key growth driver for us. Uh, and then we sell to government labs all over the world like USGA and, and Health Canada. Um, could we just go back? You, you mentioned... Um... Uh, you sell to some of the biggest uh, organizations uh, out, out there in the world. And like there, there are no, in, in other certain parts of the world, there's no uh, hydrogen trucks uh, driving around. You like these big machines, you, you're in a sense complementary to them in some way and kind of replace them. This is like using the PC analogy. They're big mainframes or server farms and yours is kind of a PC. You're not... Like there's a world for a, 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 a server farm to do heavy lifting and stuff. But if you just want to do a smaller, maybe less precise or not, you, you have the desktop machine, you can maybe test it out and then send it to the expensive machine for the even more detailed. How, how is it kind of used or, or in what ways is your used versus the big million dollar machine? Yeah, you're totally right. And I really like the computing analogy because it's not an either or scenario. It's a, it's, it is indeed a both and, right? And so, you know, um, when the first PC came out, a lot of people said, well, you know, why, why would you create a personal computer, right? And then, of course, we know how that went. But the fact that all of us on this call are using laptops um, doesn't take away from the fact that they're still, they're not called mainframes anymore, but there's, you know, specialized rooms with millions of dollars of blade servers in there, right? And, and so you're totally right. Um, in the lab instrumentation world, it's, it's the same thing. You're always going to have a need for $5 million, $20 million machines to do, to do certain things. But then you also have a need for um, more expensive, you know, more portable, you know, easier to use, more accessible uh, machine. So, so that's, that's part of it. I mean, some, there is a sort of perception out there um, that, you know, we're sort of taking away business from, from somebody who's considering buying a big machine. And, and in some cases, that, that's probably true. But to be honest, most of our customers have many of those big machines, but they can't use them in certain places and they can't use them in certain circumstances. So they have several of our machines that they put in specialized places that they and they move around and certain types of users use our machines um, and so on. So, so for example, if you're, um, you know, if you're um, a Nobel Prize winning researcher at Princeton and you're looking for the origins of life in an amoeba, you're not going to use our machines to do that. You're going to have a $20 million machine from Bruker. You're going to have like a $50 million budget for 10 years. And you're going to study amoebas in the $20 million machine. But if you're doing bread and butter organic chemistry at BASF or Corning, um, you don't need those large machines to do that. Our machines work just fine. And then to make the, you know, the, the same analogy on the medical imaging side, if you have a catastrophic um, car accident and you're rushed to the hospital 
You're not going to get put in a machine by an analysis. You're going to get put in a $20 million machine by General Electric. Um, but those machines aren't required if you want to analyze your prostate in a preventative way or, 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 or analyze a, a, you know, a high school player's foot, you know, head at, at, a, at a, a rural um, you know, high school. So you'll go in analysis means, machines. And just like on the industrial analysis side, the market opportunity, we believe, um, for, for the smaller machines and the more accessible machines, combined with the democratization of the data, um, is a bigger market opportunity than sort of the catastrophic or the, you know, um, researching the origins of the universe kind of market opportunity. So that, we're, you know, we're, we're, we're positioned perfectly to take advantage of that. All right. So talk a little bit about our team. And I've already mentioned that the original group that I put together 11 years ago is still all with the company and driving us toward, towards our vision. We have a fabulous group of people that we've layered on top of them uh, over the years to scale up our business. Um, I've already talked uh, about our CFO and he's going to uh, talk about our Q2 financials here in a couple of slides. So I'll let, I'll let him speak for himself. But uh, we have a really fabulous senior independent board of directors. A couple of great examples there are Martin Buren, who's our chairman. Uh, he came into our business uh, um, concurrent with the public listing. I really hit it off with Martin during that process and he kind of represents the new money that has come into our company since we've gone public. Uh, a really tremendous uh, M&A experience. So he kind of rides shotgun with our CFO and I um, as VP of Corporate Development when we're doing these acquisitions. Um, and then another great example is Werner Gartner, uh, who's the chairman of our audit committee. Uh, he's a former uh, CFO of a large NASDAQ listed company called Novotel GPS. So, you know, um, really he scaled that business from like a $20 million market cap to a billion dollar market cap and kind of really knows what Luke and I are trying to do right here at an analysis. So just a fabulous team. And that's sort of the end of my part of the presentation, other than to emphasize um, that our headcount today is 90 people, fabulously talented, all shareholders in the company, really well motivated to make us success. Most of these people are in our facility in Calgary, but then we have full-time salespeople uh, in different regions. And then we have about 25 growing to 30 employees in our facility in the heart of Europe in Strasbourg. So with that, um, maybe I'll, unless Martin, unless you have some questions, I'll, I'll turn it over to our CFO, Luke Caplet, uh, who will be happy to go over through a couple of slides and also answer any, any questions that you, you might have, Martin. Okay, that's great. I do want to flip back to some of your, your, your prior slides after. We can do Luke stuff first and then slip back. But so, and um, Luke uh, does not have a video today. So he is the voice uh, of Luke here joining us. So uh, Luke, why don't you uh, take over and uh, walk us through some of your, the financial highlights? Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Sean and Martin. Yeah, my apologies to everyone on the call. I don't have my webcam with me, so I'm incognito right now. But uh, just to add some color, kind of, on Sean's presentation of how our Q2 numbers looked. I know it's kind of weird talking about Q2 and it's almost November, which is scary to think. Uh, we will be doing an earnings call in the middle of November with more details to follow in our Q3. So I'd encourage everyone on here to look out for that and take part. Um, but for our, our Q2 numbers, as Sean alluded to, we are seeing 100% growth. So we're up 118% quarter over quarter, which we're very excited about. And we're still seeing a large back order on our, our 100 megahertz. So you know, as at Q2, we still had 2,400 megahertz on pre-order um, and we're still seeing orders continue to come in. So one of the issues, I guess, maybe not an issue, probably a good problem to have because demand's so high for the 100 megahertz is we did have limited production capacity for the last few months. So we've only shipped 1,500 megahertz um, as at June 30th uh, with 24 on pre-order. And we made the decision to increase double the size of our manufacturing facility in order to alleviate that capacity constraint. So we're only at three a month uh, during the quarter of Q2. Uh, we have a goal, 10 a month come 2022. So uh, the team's striving for that, getting everything set up. Luke, you launched the 100 megahertz back in December or January. So this is, uh, this is still early in the launch year, right? Yep, yep, absolutely. We shipped a couple in December of 2020, um, but for the most part, really shipment started January 1st, 2021. And um, just roughly, uh, the, the revenues in uh, a four point, like it doubled. Um, what was the break up of that? Like how much of that growth came out of uh, like the 100 megahertz units or just organic growth coming out of uh, 
the um uh the, the other products can you just roughly break out how those uh yeah. revenues are yeah. segmented of course so of that 4.3 million 1.4 of it roughly was 100 megahertz um so we're also seeing significant demand still uh, increasing demand actually for our 60 megahertz and uh, rstd as well has been a huge contributor so it's kind of all cylinders firing the 100 megahertz is going to be our huge catalyst for growth uh, coming into the future years here. And so when we get, you know, that goal of being able to produce and ship 10 a month, you can do the math really easy and say that's 1.5 million a month of just 100 megahertz that they have capacity for, you know, demand, uh, demand will see. Um, but that's how much we did in all of Q2. So we're, we're really excited for everything to come on board uh, online in our, our expansion the manufacturing facility. And on that note, I'll kind of drive into margins. So our margins were 67% for Q2. As you alluded to, Martin, um, we're not seeing any pricing pressures. If anything, it's the opposite as orders continue to come in. And anytime you're moving something from R&D down into an actual production stage, you know, we see some, some inefficiencies that, uh, like, for example, assembling the magnet array could take 200 hours and the R&D team's working to get that down to 50. So we're confident that those margins are going to, you know, stay healthy and continue to increase. Um, also important to note on our expansion, it's really cheap. It's not capital intensive for us to expand. We have our, you know, our SMT machine for, for making boards. We have our CNC machine. Um, that's not at full capacity. So it's not like we're going out there and spending millions and millions of dollars um, in order to expand. We, we put up a few walls. We hire some really smart interns from U of C that, you know, we get government grants back for them, uh, put them on the floor. And it's really, really cheap to expand our, our capacity. Um, that being said, we did do 1.2 million uh, in Q2 for EBITDA. So we are cash flow positive. Um, we did our raise. This was a, a key metric for doing our raise and getting in, you know, the $11 million that we did. Uh, we didn't need the cash. Uh, we, we pay our 50 scientists on our operations itself right now. Uh, but, you know, the cash is going to help us expand the acquisition strategy uh, that we're really excited about over here that Sean alluded to. If you want to pop on the next slide for me, Sean. Thank you. So yeah, uh, like I said, we didn't need the cash. We had 4 million in the bank. Obviously we raised another 11 million. It was a part bought deal private placement that we closed on August 25th. Uh, so we're really excited about that. We're gonna put that to good use to start acquiring some companies that you know we've been in talks with for a while and we're excited about. Uh, I get asked a lot on inventory. So at uh, June 30th, we had 2.8 million of inventory. We keep a really healthy inventory balance right now. Um, it's twofold. One, obviously, we're seeing some inflationary uh, pricing pressures on some of our supplies. So it's better ordering now uh, when we know prices increases are coming. We're not hurting for cash. Um, number two is just being cognizant of procurement issues right now. So we're not immune to all the shipping procurement issues, but we are very diligent and we've been carefully monitoring, you know, lead times for important parts. So we are, we're stocked up on inventory and we're, uh, we're making sure we're, we're careful that we're not going to be stuck, you know, with some some vendor shipping timelines that impact our, our capacity to produce. Um, we did have three and a half million of unearned revenue. So I like to just point this out because us accountants like to complicate everything. Unearned revenue is a little different from backlog. So when I say we have 2,400 megahertz on pre-order and we have 3.4 million of unearned revenue, those are different metrics. Unearned revenue is what we've already been paid for. So if you kind of look at my breakout, only a million of that is actually related to those 24 uh, megahertz pre-orders. So if you kind of do some fun math, you go, okay, uh, you have X number of pre-orders, a million of that is 100 megahertz. We have roughly 5 million of backlog sitting on our books right now. Um, and then last but not least, all of our debt is interest-free. We get tons of government grants. So we're always, you know, being as smart as possible where we can get our capital, where we can get funding from the government and support, keep margins high. Um, we just won a gamma MRI project that we announced previously, uh, I think around January, 2021 for 1.2 million non-refundable. We get something called CIR, which is shred credits. Uh, that's over in France to support our R and D efforts in France. That's roughly 300,000 a year. We're taking advantage of the new shred program in Alberta here, uh, for 2021. That could be upwards of to 800 K per year. Um, conservatively, we're assuming we'll be around 250 to, you know, 400 on that. We do get some industrial grants, 150K a year. And as I previously mentioned, we get grants for our interns and any new hires, 25%. So we are, we're very cognizant and we're making sure we can turn over every rock where there's some money to be found. Um, Luke and 
My apologies. Uh, Luke and Sean, you've got a, a healthy uh, balance sheet right now and you are profitable. What is the basic plan for with that extra uh, cash on the balance sheet? Are you going to be raising spending up or, or like you could hit the accelerator and burn a whole bunch of money and hire a hundred salespeople around the world? It, are you trying to grow at sort of a cash flow neutral basis or trying to Let's say every year we're going to put together a, a couple million EBITDA, or you're going to try to grow EBIT. What are your priorities in revenue versus sort of harvesting in, in terms of profitability? Good question. Do you want that one, Sean, or you want me to take it? Uh, feel free to go ahead, Luke. Sure. Yeah. So obviously, you know, being cash flow positive is always what we're striving to be. So, uh, you know, we are using some of that cash for expansion. But as Sean said, it's all economy of scale. So we're hiring a couple people. But if you're getting seven more 100 megahertz out, you're actually just improving your, your cash flow, your margins, your EBITDA. So we're going to continue uh, you know, to operate with cash flow always in mind. We're always going to strive to be a cash flowing business. Um, but we're going to use you know, the funds on hand. Is, uh, it's set aside for acquisitions. And it's going to be the same type of you know, structure that we've done the last couple, where it's not a whole bunch of cash. It's usually kind of a 50-50 because... We don't want uh, to buy a great company and the guy to disappear with his money and he's not vested in the overall health of the analysis. So everyone's tied in with, you know, 50% paper, some healthy earnout targets, and we're all working towards the same, same goal. So that's the ideal structure for your M&A is, would you be willing to go 100% cash on that? Um, or or uh, uh, is it just the buyer saying, hey, I've built this business, I want to pay off the mortgage and uh, take a little bit of stress off, but I want to keep some growth uh, in my uh, opportunities. I'll, uh, I'll push that one to you there, Sean, since. Yeah, that's definitely what it, we would never buy a company for hundred percent cash. Um, that's just totally counter to the, um, you know, the philosophical pillars behind our acquisitions. Right. Um, you know, um, these are, 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 are largely, I mean, Luke used an example of 50-50 and, you know, um, maybe even, you know, higher ratio of, of stock than that. I think, you know, the, the, the next one that we're looking at that's at the top of our priority, um, you know, is, is like 65% uh, uh, stock and, and a minority of cash. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's to basically, uh, you know, help the company do what they, what they wanted to do on their own but couldn't. Um, and increase the value of their equity position. So, and that and that indicates you be keeping the founder or the the guys running the shop. Um, and you and then a lot of that is structured on earnout as well. Like we're buying the business, but you still have to execute to uh, get the full worth, and and so they're fully on side to execute well over the coming years. That that's absolutely right. So we were. Um, you know, I'll give you an example in, 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 in you know, in the case of, um, of our first acquisition, the founder, there, there was a few founders, but the main founder, um, you know, stuck, stayed with us for two years to help us, you know, get the integration fully accomplished and transfer all the customer relationships. You know, he's just about to turn 70 years old. So, so now it's sort of like, okay, well, you know, that was great for two years. And then, um, and then we'll think about transitioning you out into, into retirement in an orderly fashion. But then another one of the founders, uh, sort of a, a minority founder, um, is now our CTO. And he's, you know, 42 years of age. He's at the prime of his career. Um, and he's going to be a key guy for our company over the next 10 years. So that's the kind of way we work with the, with the founders, depending on the specifics of their situation and the stage of their career and so on. All right. Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. So I think, you know, Luke and I have gone through the deck in, in a way that is um, consistent with our usual approach. So um, at this point, uh, Martin, you're definitely the boss. So if you want us to flip around some more to previous slides or ask us some more questions. Yeah, I'd love to. to. If that. you could flip back, um, I think it's two or three before you got into the, the financials. This, I know one more, uh, no one that did... Uh... Uh, um, all right, let, let's, um, on, on your growth strategy, um, you're essentially, you're going to be, to, so like, you, 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 typical growth strategies are, you, you just, you buy revenues, or you buy distribution, you buy technology, 
and you, you buy into new market opportunities. And it sounds like you're not buying revenue just for revenue. It's all very strategic. But um, uh, do I have that right? And I don't know, can you give a little more nuance to that? Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. And the, the way I think of it is, you know, we have um, a growth pipeline, right? And so we have like long-term aspects of our growth pipeline. You know, uh, we have medium-term aspects. Um, and then we have short-term aspects of our growth pipeline. Um, when I talk about our growth pipeline, I just mean general for our company, not just specifically sales, but just in general. And so, you know, the, my job as CEO is to make sure that our growth pipeline in a way that makes sense is full for the next 10 years, right? So this very day, I will be working on stuff that, you know, contributes to our growth in the next two months. I'll also be working on stuff that's going to contribute to our growth in two years from now. And I'll also be working on real things that contribute to our growth five to seven years from now. Um, and I spend every day um, on that growth pipeline and making sure that it's um, making sure that it's full. In terms of specific, that growth pipeline involves future new products uh, that we're developing organically. Um, it involves acquisitions, like specific acquisitions, and and building those relationships with companies because I know that in two years I'm going to want to buy them. So I'm 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 building on the relationship foundation right now. Um, it involves um, industry partnerships in, in new verticals. And then it also involves sort of honing my story on, on how I communicate um, with new types of investors and, and kind of learning what their perspective is on our story and trying to improve uh, how I tell our story. So all aspects of our growth pipeline is critical to our company. Could you talk about your distribution currently? How are you making your sales? Is it through an internal network, through distributors? And where is your, are, are you, are, do you have, is it sort of spread out globally? Or are you more North American focused or, or concentrated? Yeah, so our, our most important market is the United States and we sell direct in the United States. Uh, we also sell direct in Canada and, and Switzerland and Germany and France. Um, and uh, my vision is that in the major markets in the world, um, to build out our direct sales organization and service, you know, and so, you know, looking forward into the future when we have medical imaging pro um, products for human beings, as well as industrial analysis products, uh, my vision is to be able to do um, direct sales and service, whether it's a hospital in Menlo Park, California, or whether it's a corn processing facility in Iowa, right? So, um, so we know that direct sales of our current products works better than distributor sales. Uh, we do have a, a pretty good distributor network, but we need to continue to enhance it. So for example, today, our products in, in China or India or Indonesia or Chile are sold through a network of dealers. And these are dealers that would sell complementary products and services and therefore be knocking on the same doors um, that we would be knocking on if we had a direct presence um, in those particular markets. So we'll, we'll continue to expand our sales and distributor network kind of organically, but we'll also, um, it's also pertinent to our acquisition strategy. Um, and we expect that uh, it's highly likely that one of those uh, will be something that you'll he be hearing about fairly soon. I, I would is not using distributors in the in the local markets or the sort of the, the G7 call it. Um, is that because yours is still a kind of a relatively new product class and you have to sort of educate them? This is what we do. Oh, I didn't know there was a, a desktop NRMR uh, machine. And once it would maybe be, oh, yeah, I get a whatever, a radio spectra, I don't know all the different instruments, but you're one in a sort of a catalog, then that could maybe be pushed off a distributor. It, just maybe that's years. In the, but is that roughly sort of the rationale for how how it's structured at this point? That's absolutely right. You know, in terms of like the, the product adoption lifecycle bell curve, right? We're still at the beginning stages 
of that bell curve. In fact, you know, statistically, the penetration of our opportunity is still 0%, right? It's, it's totally greenfields. And um, our sa salespeople have to have really good knowledge on the applications that are uh, associated with our devices. Um, and so, um, you know, we do um, have some success with, with some distributors. For example, our, our distributor um, in India is excellent. Our distributor in Japan is excellent. Um, but then we have some distributors uh, that really aren't doing a great job for us yet, and we need to continue to educate them. So as our products become, you know, closer to the top of that product adoption bell curve, that's when we'll, um, um, you know, large distribution deals with very large companies that really need volume, like huge volumes in order to make those deals work. That's when you'll see some of those things. And then in our particular case, there'll be value added distribution deals. Right. And, and so both in terms of their, their, their large brand, but also in terms of a layer of software that is specific to a particular vertical market. So you'll see those types of deals um, coming down the pike as well. But right now we know we have a fabulous direct sales organization and we're going to do a couple of very particular things to grow that sales organization. You know, one of the things that has been a philosophical point for me when I founded the company is uh, I mentioned one, I didn't want to have our technology ripped off. So I took specific steps there, but I also, also wanted to always control my own destiny. So um, we control our fate with our direct sales organization and to the extent, so I'm never going to look for like a savior in terms of our growth. I, I don't need a savior. We're our own savior. And part of that is a strong and awesome direct sales organization. When you're selling, are you selling to people who kind of never knew they had the sort of problem that you're, you're solving for them? Like they never knew a desktop machine existed. So like, oh, we don't. And then like, oh, we we could use that. We've never thought about that opportunity. We always sort of waited in line to get access for a, a couple of days to the million dollar uh, machine or how does that sort of, and, and do you compete with like, do you compete with other guys? Like, oh, well, we're looking at yours versus the Brooker or the whoever <laughs> others uh, simple. And then we're going to do like a, a taste test, so to speak, uh, who, who's going to win this? Yeah. A typical reaction when we, when we meet a new potential customer is, and this is like a, almost a literal quote, wow, I didn't know magnetic resonance could be so small. And, you know, that's a pretty good starting point uh, uh, to begin a sales cycle. And, and, and so um, what has happened over the last 25 years is, is, and now I'm referring to my slide here, the picture on the bottom left of these large machines for industrial analysis, um, they've established themselves as the gold standard. So you would always want to use mag magnetic resonance to analyze, you know, your olive oil or your jet fuel or your new drug or your cannabis oil or your polymer or your vet. You'd always want to use magnetic resonance if you could, right? Um, so we haven't had to educate um, our, our market um, on the, um, the benefits of using magnetic resonance. All we've done is said, hey, we built this awesome miniature device that you can use anywhere and it's very easy to use. You can use it directly. You don't have to send your sample to a different department or a different place on your campus or to a different city and wait three days to get it back. So it's a really nice thing to market. Our customers are more knowledgeable than we are on you know, how magnetic resonance is used. And so we just need to kind of get them comfortable with, you know, kind of application by application, get them comfortable with um, the specifics of the small machine compared to the big machine. But those specifics are, are pretty minor. Okay. And um, so how big, like, you talked about a $3 billion market opportunity, I, I think. Like, how many, like, do you have direct competitors on sort of the desktop couple hundred thousand unit and how big is the current market yeah we i mean like i say um i think last year you know um you know like i said the 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 penetration of this of this three billion dollar market opportunity is still basically zero um you know so last year something like 30 million dollars would have been spent in this area and we think that's going to continue to double every year for many years uh, to come um, so you're one of the leaders in that you've got what a third market third 30 to 50 percent market share i'm not exactly sure all your revenue segmented but somewhere so in that, that range that's right and so we are the leader in this space 
Um, and we do have an arch competitor, though, that uh, we have a lot of respect for. That's a, you know, a formidable opponent. Um, it's a company called Magertech, and it's a New Zealand-based company, similar size uh, to us. We feel our, our products and our technology are better because we've spent more time miniaturizing the magnet part of the system, uh, which is the, 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 more, the, the most difficult technical challenge. Early on, they spent more time and money on the, on the electronics and low-level software side. Um, well, we were focused in on the magnet, but we since leapfrogged them with our acquisition of the company in Europe. And then we've integrated their electronics and software into our overall system. But a great company. We compete against them every single day all over the world um, and, and, you know, for real customer uh, business, I mean. And on the medical imaging side, um, you know, GE, GE, Siemens and Philips have a cartel in place. They don't really view anybody as, as competitors, but, but one day they, they will see us as a threat on that side as well. And in that market, are you, cause you're supplying, you, you, um, we've talked before you do some like retrofits on MRI machines and, and sort of spruce up an old machine. So you're not really going head to head with them. You're kind of picking up some crumbs in this giant market and finding a couple little niches there. That's right. Um, uh, you know, and uh, like I mentioned before, about two million of trailing twelve-month revenue associated with medical imaging will continue to grow. That um, we're working very closely with key suppliers, um, historical suppliers of GE, Siemens, and Philips on the MRI space. So you know, we're not we're not taking on this grand challenge by ourselves. We're working very closely uh, with partners, and several of those are are serious acquisition targets of ours. All right. Um, could you go to the slide where you have the BASF and um, the, the SARTEC? Or the Bosch, sorry. Um, uh, and um, so you've announced these deals where you're, you're making really application, application specific detectors. They're not going to be an, an all-around general PC where you can play video games and do whatever. It's going to be designed with the software. It's going to, you're going to put in one type of sample or a small type, and it's going to give you a red light or a green light. And then it's just a tool that any bumpkin like me could just put in a, a dipstick of sample and I, I tell if it's good or not good. Is that roughly it? That, that's exactly right. You know, um, the majority of our customers, you know, I, I'm going to almost say almost all of our customers today use our products as general purpose analyzers. They analyze multiple things. And, and um, so in that sense, we're kind of a platform company, right? Um, and then at the same time, we're incubating these um, specific analyzer products with partners to go deep in particular uh, verticals. And so... Um, you know, again, part of our sort of S-curve uh, growth strategy for the future is to superimpose these deep vertical partnerships on top of the, the, the sales of our current products, will, which will always be a growth driver for us. And on these, um, they, some of these announcements have been out a while. What kind of time frame are we looking at until we start seeing some sort of commercial launch or traction, or it's going to start hitting the, uh, the, the revenue line on things? Yeah, you know, um, we've talked about our growth for this year, and, and Luke mentioned we're on track to do 100% year-over-year growth. Um, I've been stating publicly that I think we can do that again in 2022 and again in 2023. And that sort of, you know, gets us from like a, you know, 17 million to, to 30 million to like, you know, 60 to 70 million in, in revenue. The majority of that is going to be with our current product portfolio and maybe 30% of it through some acquisitions that we'll, we'll do. Um, so we're not re really relying on these um, um, partnerships with, with Bosch and Sartec and others, uh, the German, uh, German um, police called LKA, um, for the growth in the next two years. Um, so again, going back to my philosophical pillar of we're controlling our own destiny to hit those numbers that I talked about, we can do that ourselves. I don't need to sign a giant deal with Bosch or with, with Sartek to hit those numbers. Um, but we are working very, uh, very seriously on these partnerships. And there's others that, uh, that are in play too, that haven't been publicly announced. And those are going to contribute to, uh, growth, you know, 18 months out, two years out, and, 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 and beyond. 
Um, so that's one area of our business where the pandemic has um, delayed things. You know, uh, just a, a, a real specific example is, you know, we've been trying to schedule a test of our, of our machines on a cargo ship with Bosch forever, but the pandemic has just made it impossible to do. Um, you know, Bosch is a by the book company. Um, so all the rules associated with the pandemic, they follow explicitly. And, and you know, so, but the relationship with them has been, has been fabulous and we can continue to strengthen that relationship. But that's probably one of the areas that the pandemic has slowed down is these partnership um, that partnerships that we've we've signed and and have been working on have been delayed from the pandemic. So what I've done as CEO, I've tried to sort of flip a, a negative into a positive, and in Bosch's case, for example, um, show them that we're financially stable and strong, patient, reliable supplier. They don't need to worry about. Um, you know, we're not in a panic, like got to launch something with you next month or, you know, so, so they really appreciated that. And actually, um, we haven't publicly disclosed some of these items, but they've started to introduce us into other, um, other vertical opportunities like fuel analyzers with large automotive companies associated with um, um, having them in, at gas stations and so on and associated with environmental regulation. So, so we've really been able to strengthen that relationship with Bosch and with some of these other entities, even though the technical joint development has, has slowed down a bit because of the pandemic. Okay, so your, your growth, your, your expected growth curve is not impacted, but still these are a couple years away before they, they, they kind of start making some impact maybe here. That's right. And, and those are going to things that are going to take us from like a, a, you know, a $70 million per year revenue company uh, to like a 200 to $300 million revenue company. That's where that growth is going to, is going to come into play. And you talked about going into your local drugstore and getting your hip or your knee MRI to, and a quickie sort of self-service thing. Um, and you're working down the path for that. I presume that is not near term revenue as well. Is that like five, 10 year kind of time frame we're talking about? Not that long, no. Um, oh, okay. not, not, not that long. So um, so we're working with companies on, on, on that uh, product right now. And I expect to pull the trigger on a key acquisition in that area in about two years. Um, and that will catapult us right into the middle of an ongoing FDA approved process for, for a product. Um, so, 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 you know, three to five years in terms of revenue generation on the human medical imaging side, like in a big way, I mean, um, not just in terms of the odd research uh, area and so on, but, but actually a full blown, you know, marketed product. Um, it'd be more like three to five years, not, not, not the numbers you talked about. Oh, okay. And I really want to emphasize because, um, you know, this is a key part of our story that all the work we're doing now on the industrial analysis side and, and then the partnership side, it's all contributing um, to that uh, future FDA approved product. They're, they're not separate initiatives um, in any sense of that word. Okay. And um, so we have a question here from the audience. What's going to drive revenue growth over the next year? I think we've kind of addressed that. But could you give us, let's say, over the next six or like, geez, we're already almost at 21 here. Um, what kind of news flow coming out in, in, in 22 should we expect? Presumably, hopefully higher revenue, like continued revenue growth maybe an acquisition or two and like new product launches um, sort of yeah. lead. So, yeah. I mean, um, so I'll just touch on the revenue thing. So the, 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 the biggest growth driver for us in, in 2022 is going to be our hundred megahertz product. And I've shown that on this slide just to answer the, the specific question of your subscriber. Um, and then in terms of your questions, the catalyst will be, yeah, um, you're going to see partnering announcements like application uh, uh, partnerships, uh, you're you're going to see us close um, at least one acquisition in the near term. I mean, I mean, I'm shooting for before Christmas, um, and then further further acquisitions in 2022. You'll see, of course, ongoing financial um, 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 uh, press releases about revenue growth and so on. You're going to see further independent analysts uh, initiate coverage and and you know putting out fabulous information on, on our company. My objective also, which I'm submitting to the board, is a uh, to go um, to uplist. Um, so there's, there, you know, we already satisfy the requirements for the big board. We already satisfy the requirements for 
uh, for the NASDAQ. But, um, um, but um, you know, um, I'm thinking about, you know, possibly towards the end of, of 2022, um, uplisting to the TSX big board. The NASDAQ, people ask me about that. And, and you know, that's some, something that's sort of part of the vision is one day we will be a NASDAQ listed company, but no need to do that now. And so that would be something that would be three or four years out. Um, but it certainly sort of represents sort of the pinnacle of kind of where I want to go as a company. All right. Well, with that, we're well over an hour here. So, uh, Sean, uh, we really appreciate uh, your, your time here talking to us and uh, teaching us about an analysis. So we should wrap it up here. And I think you had some great closing comments here, but any sort of final wrap up uh, statement from you? I, I really appreciate the opportunity to tell our story to, to your subscriber base, Martin. And I know I've, I've known you for quite a few years, so I always enjoy speaking with you uh, directly. And, you know, I just would like to sort of respectfully submit to your audience that I think our company is, is really unique, especially in terms of the venture exchange companies in, in that we have this grand vision that's going to turn us into a multi-billion dollar company. But we're also building a strong uh, foundation with real products, real revenue, demonstrated profitability. And our path from here to that grand vision is incremental in nature. And you'll be, you'll have full transparency on everything that we're doing from, from going from here to there. So I, I think, you know, in terms of the magnetic resonance side, um, and, and the financial side, it makes us unique as a stock and also as a company. And uh, I really uh, hope we get the support of your subscribers. I also like speaking to shareholders um, um, individually. So uh, please reach out to me if you'd like to talk more. All right, Sean and Luke, thank you very much for taking your time to uh, chat with us. Uh, it's been great, very informative. And um, we're, I'm looking forward to seeing uh, what you get done at the rest of this year and through next year. Thank you very much and have a great day. Thanks, Martin. Cheers.